Hello and welcome to another webinar from the National Financial Education Center. Uh, my name is Sharla and I am a financial educator uh, with Debt Reduction Services. And today we'll be going over the subject of debt, how to get yourself out of debt, um, Project Debt to Nation, Household Finances for Debt-Proof Living. All right, well to get started, a quick background. Um, the National Financial Education Center, which is part of Debt Reduction Services, uh, is a nationwide nonprofit organization. Uh, we're headquartered in Boise, Idaho, been here since 1996. Uh, but we do have offices all over the country. Uh, one of the main missions of this organization is financial education. Uh, we facilitate hundreds of classes a year to thousands of participants. Um, and uh, debt management is just one of the many topics that we, we cover. So uh, during this presentation today, uh, we'll be going over a few different subjects. A uh, quick outline. Uh, the first section is managing your money. We're going to touch briefly on that B word, the budget. Um, next section is understanding debt and then dealing with your current debt and how to avoid and minimize debt in the future. Uh, one thing I do want to mention before we really get started, uh, throughout the presentation I'll be mentioning three different passcodes. Uh, you will need to write those down exactly as they're written on the screen in order to get credit for this course. Uh, you'll have to go back to the website where you located this webinar and there should be a quiz available and it'll ask you for those passcodes and you'll have to answer some questions to receive credit. Uh, so remember to write those down. Okay, well, first of all, we're going to discuss some different signs of financial trouble. Uh, if any of these things sound familiar to you, it's possible you could be in a little more debt than what is healthy for you. Um, the first sign is having no savings. The bills, the debt payments, all of your survival needs consume all of your money every month. There's nothing left, left to save. Uh, and it's shown that if you have less than $1,000 in saving, you're at a much higher risk for filing bankruptcy. Um, so having money in savings is always an, a must. So if it's impossible to save anything, we might be in all over our heads. Um, the next one is making only minimum payments and credit cards. Uh, this isn't including, you know, making your house payment, but we're really talking about here is credit cards. Uh, we all know that we've heard it over and over again, the only making money on payments is, is committing us to years worth of payments and taking 20, 30, 40 years to pay off a credit card balance. Uh, so it, it's also a very expensive way to operate. So if we're to the point where those payments are so high that all we can make is a minimum payment, we have no prospect of, of paying it off any faster, then we know we're in a, it's a good sign of financial trouble. The, the next one is turning to a payday lender. Uh, these are very high cost, high risk loans. This usually comes from a person who is at the top of their credit limits. They've maxed out the cards. They can't afford the payments anymore. Uh, something happens, I need a short term loan. So these are attractive, um, but they are very expensive and very difficult to get away from. So if we're to the point where a payday lender is the last place we can turn, uh, we know we're seeing some signs of financial trouble. And we can also throw in with payday loans, title loans, rent-to-owns, pawn shops, tax refund anticipation loans. Uh, we'll cover those in a little more detail later, though. We're to the point where we have to work overtime just to cover our basic expenses. A lot of people have found this out the hard way when you have this job with the supposed over guaranteed over time and then all of a sudden if if this business or this employer suffers any kind of um, downturn in business uh, first thing to go is usually the overtime for everybody so when we built our lifestyle to meet the income of an overtime job and all of a sudden the overtime is cut we, we can no longer afford all of the debt we have or to cover our expenses so relying on your overtime is kind of a dangerous way to be living. So that's a sign of a financial trouble. Uh, we're to this point where we're saying, statement? What statement? I don't read my mail. <laughs> um, this is a person who doesn't even want to look at it anymore. The debt has grown. It's overwhelming. Have no desire whatsoever to see the statements, to balance the checkbook, uh, to ensure even accuracy. So. Um, 
if we're to the point where we won't even open our mail anymore, we know we're, we're in some financial trouble. Going over limit on your credit cards or on that debit card or the checking account, you know, that's overdrawing your account. Uh, if we are going over the limit on the credit card, that's an expensive place to go. Uh, the swap on a lot of fees and not not fun. And then we all know what happens when you overdraw your checking account, expensive uh, bounce fees and overdraft protection, and, and that can really add up because a lot of them charge you a fee every day or an interest rate. So if we don't even know where our limits are on the credit card or what my status is in the checking account, like if I make this $1 purchase, is it going to overdraw my account? I don't even know. We know we're in financial trouble, not paying attention. Okay, uh, the next one, well, actually, you can go back. You can see it changed to decline card, and it can also mean declining your card. If, if you get to the point where uh, you use it and they turn it down, well, and you were just hoping it'd go through, that means we're really not in a good place. Okay, the next one, uh, borrowing from family. Just to cover your basic expenses, the debt has overwhelmed you so much that to make payments on the debt does not leave you enough money even to put food on the table and to pay rent. So we've got to borrow from someone else to make ends meet. 20% uh, or more of your take-home pay is going to minimum payments on your loans. Uh, this would exclude your mortgage, uh, but it would include credit cards, car loans, student loans, things like that. If we get to the point where 20% or more of that take-home pay is going to the loans, it gets pretty difficult to live on what's left. Uh, in order to be comfortable, we need to have less 20% or less of our income going to loan payments. Uh, we delay going to the doctor. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this before, but you don't either have the money to go or you don't want to pay the money for the copay, or you don't want to know what they're going to say because you're afraid it'll cost more. Uh, and we all know how important our health is, so if we're to the point where we have to delay going to the doctor just because of our financial situation, we know we need to do something about this. Uh, are you suffering from the what-if insomnia? <laughs> you spend a lot of time at night worrying about your money rather than during the day when you can actually do something about it. You know, this is the what-if insomnia, the what-if, 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 what if the car breaks down, what if I lose my job, what if I get sick, what if my child breaks his, or ar his arm? You know, what if, what if, what if? Uh, it's not a fun game to play. Okay, so that brings us to the very first passcode. Remember to write this down. It's DEMAND. It's in all capital letters. All right. So now we're to the point where you're saying, okay, okay, some of that sounded familiar. Yeah, that might be me. Or So what am I supposed to do about it? What is the first step to getting out of debt? What do you think the first step would be? Ask yourself, what would I do first? How do I get myself out of debt? Well, I would say the first step would be to stop the slide. Uh, don't get into any more debt. This might be the time to cut up the credit card or at least put it in the back of the stock drawer and the other pair of socks you have. Do not get into more debt. And the way to not get into more debt would be to develop a spending plan. Remember I said we'd mentioned the B word a little bit. Here it is, the budget. Uh, it's very important that we get on a spending plan. By nature, we tend to want to spend more money than we make. That's just how life is. I have an unlimited list of wants and a very limited amount of money. Um, so if I'm not living by a budget and I'm not on a spending plan, I will spend more money than I bring in. Easy to do. So then the last thing that we need to look at is, well, where is my money going? Where, what what got me into debt? What was I buying? Was I buying things that I really needed? Uh, what kind of habits do I have? I need to take a look at myself and, and figure out what my spending habits are. Okay. So the next section, generally when, when we give this class in person, um, we have people say this all together. You know, I live by a budget. I live by a budget. I live by a budget. Uh, you might want to say that to yourself. You can do it later when you're by yourself. That's okay. But... It does help to say this out loud. This is some self-affirmation, and trust me, if you if you say this, if you write it down and put it in your wallet, or I know somebody who wrote this on our bathroom mirror, <laughs> and you see it all the time. The next time you're at a store, you see something on the shelf, and you're like, hmm, I'd really like to buy that. You pick it up and look at it, and all of a sudden, there I am. I'll pop into your head. I live by a budget. And you'll remember that. And you'll be like, ooh, you know what? 
I don't think I want to get this anymore. This doesn't fit with my budget. You're going to put it back on the shelf, and then you know what's going to happen. You're going to feel awesome because you have taken control. You live by a budget, and you decide where your money's going. So that being said, um, here are some of the spending habits that we've identified that most people out there share. Um, I know I'm guilty of all of the above, <laughs> at least on a weekly basis. Now, um, it's something that we all deal with. Uh, the first one is the convenience spending. Uh, this is the person who doesn't have time to shop around. Uh, when the things are convenient, we spend more money. It is absolutely true. We pay for convenience. Uh, think about the prices in a convenience store versus the grocery store. They're always more expensive. And, and somebody who makes a habit out of being a convenience shopper can find themselves getting into debt pretty easily because those little purchases can really add up. Uh, so that's the convenience spender, and this can go for things like drive through um, not making your shopping list, and getting things on a whim, which actually that fits under the impulse. But convenience is, is buying things right when you need it, where it's convenient to buy it. And that always leads to spending more money than it would if it were a planned purchase. The next one is the entitled spender. This is the person who deserves this purchase. Oh, I've had the worst day ever. You know, such and such happened. Nobody loves me. Nobody appreciates me. I work so hard. Um, I need a little shopping therapy. I deserve some ice cream, and I need it now. So on the other hand, you've got the other person. Wow, this has been the greatest day ever. Woohoo! Uh, let's go celebrate. Uh, this is buying things because you deserve them. Oh, so this can be very hard to battle, but the best way to do it is with a little bit of the spending money. So you can have that on hand. When you've had that horrible day, you can go relax, but it still can be under control. The next one is the compensatory spending. Um, this is spending on things people can see. You're compensating. You're saying, this is who I am. I want people to think that I am smart and I'm cool and I'm savvy and I'm stylish, and so I better buy these clothes, this shoe, these shoes, this house, this car. Uh, not because you really even need it or really can justify purchasing it, but it sure looks nice and you think people will think you look nice and you feel like that will make you a better person. Uh, when in reality, uh, what's important is on the inside. And so before buying something, you know, ask yourself, is this a practical purchase? Is this something that I really need? Um, we can easily go into debt buying the things that we think everyone else wants us to buy. Keeping up with the Joneses and keeping up with the Joneses is a very expensive way to live. Uh, the next one is habitual spending. Uh, spending can become a habit. We we develop the way we like to do things, and it's really hard to change. And sometimes we aren't even aware of our financial habits. Uh, when you start tracking your expenses and seeing where your money is going, you might be shocked to say, wow, I didn't realize I spent so much on that one little thing. You know, I could change that one little thing in my lifestyle and it could make a $50, $100 difference a month. Prepare to be amazed. Uh, I'm telling you, it's happened to me. Uh, cutting out one eating out a week has saved me anywhere from, what, 40 to $80 a month. And, and it can make a huge difference on the budget. Okay, impulse purchases. Um, this one's huge. This is the one I suffer with the most. I'll, I'll confess. Um, these are the appealing items that you see it, you want it, you buy it. Uh, they appear to be very attractive. They smell good. They taste good. They sound good. You think they'll make you look good. Um, you buy it without thinking. Uh, we have a whole discussion about all of these spending habits in our Spending by Color uh, webinar. Um, so I don't want to repeat myself too much here, but you know, with the impulse purchases, I really hit hard the way the stores are set up and the way they entice people to shop. I mean, I don't know if anybody's been into stores and they've noticed that every time they go there, things are in a different spot. It can be a little frustrating, but I've had many, many people that work in retail, and I've worked in retail myself, so I know that we move things around on purpose. You put something one place, it won't sell very much. You put it somewhere else, for some reason, it looks more attractive, and people buy it like crazy. Uh, it's all about the setup and how it looks, you know, the end caps at the grocery stores, um, putting things in a bin so they look like a discount, you know, it, it catches our attention and, and we think it's a deal that we can't resist. Which brings us into sales spending. 
this is very similar to impulse um, because we feel time pressured. You know, if, if it doesn't happen right now, it's not going to happen. And that's how sales are this weekend only. Um, buying items on sale in and of itself isn't a bad thing. If this is something you need, shoot, that's great. Buy it on sale. Who wants to pay full price for anything, right? But what we're talking to is, is the person who buys it just because it's on sale. Um, you can get yourself into a lot of debt even though you buy everything on sale if you're buying more than you need. That's hard to turn it down. It's 75% off. Well, when you get a 75% off and then you make that purchase on a credit card with a 30% interest rate and you're carrying a balance on it, it won't take long for that interest to outweigh the savings, uh, quote-unquote savings, that you saved on this purchase. So buying it on sale and not needing it is a good way to get into debt. So our goal is to be that disciplined spender, to be that person that does look at that item and thinks, I live by a budget. I'm not buying that. That is what we want to be. Now, this isn't something that can happen overnight. Um, don't be too hard on yourself if you if you don't succeed right away. This is an ongoing thing for life. And, and even though I talk about this on a weekly basis, I still find myself suffering from a few of these from time to time. So, But still, this is our goal. This is where we'd like to be in control. Okay. Um, there is a discussion that we should have. It's the difference between good debt and bad debt. Uh, when you hear the word debt, it's usually a very negative, uh, in a very negative connotation, isn't it? I mean, usually that's how I hear it, like, ooh, debt, um, the bad guy. Um, but do you think that there is such a thing as good debt? Believe it or not, there are a few things that, that we could put into that category. Yeah, debt can be good. Um, a good debt is a good debt if it increases in net worth. What that means is that when I buy this item and I finance it, by the time I pay this off, it's worth more than it was when I bought it. So what do you think an item like that could be? Um, the first one is usually real estate. In theory, when you buy a home, by the time you pay it off, it should be worth more than it was when you bought it. Uh, that would be a good debt. Uh, student loans. For people who go back to school, they get a degree, they get a better paying job, and they get that loan paid off, and then throughout their lifetime, their income potential is significantly higher than someone who didn't have that degree. So that is a good debt. It's a good investment. A business loan. Uh, think of all the businesses that we all love. Uh, they probably weren't just started up by one person who had a lot of money. No. Uh, most of these businesses were started up with loans. They borrow money. Um, so the idea is that I'm starting up a business, I take out a loan, I get into business, I make money, I pay the loan off, now I'm in business and I'm making money. That's a good debt. Um, so really quickly though, we're talking about good debt, well then what's the definition of a bad debt? Well, a lot of people don't like hearing this, it's pretty much anything but those things. Um, if you buy it and by the time you pay it off, it's worth less than it was when you bought it, that, my friend, is a bad debt. Uh, car loans. You buy a vehicle, especially a brand new car, you drive it off the lot and what happens? We all know it, it depreciates in value significantly. So by the time I, I especially nowadays you can get a f car financed for seven years, uh, after you drive even a brand new car for seven years, is it worth more than it was when you bought it? No, not at all, not even close. Uh, any appliances or furniture, electronics, uh, things, clothing, people finance all of these things all the time, and those are bad debts. They are not worth more by the time you pay them off than when you started. Okay, so regardless of the reason, debt happens. It happens to everybody. Uh, it's rare to meet anybody that has zero debt. Yeah, they exist, uh, but they're not very common. Uh, and those people who don't have any debt, or maybe the, the the people that I know were once in debt and they worked hard and paid it off. Either that or they're like 18 years old and just haven't gotten into debt yet. So it does happen. So major event causes of debt. So what do you think could happen to you in your life that could cause you to go into debt? What kind of an event? Um, think about that to yourself really quickly and we'll see how you did. Um, first one, job loss or income reduction. 
believe it or not, losing your job is very expensive. <laughs> uh, a lot of us, if, we've, if we're out of a job even for two weeks, we can get behind. Um, this is very serious. When you're used to having an income and you have bills to pay, losing that income is very detrimental, and we tend to supplement that with credit. So that will lead to debt. Next one is medical bills. Uh, if you've been sick, you'll know that this can be very expensive. Even simple procedures, you can be, you can find yourself tens of thousands of dollars in debt within a matter of a couple of days, and it happens very quickly. And usually at the time, you know, of course we're going to say no, do whatever's necessary. You know, we don't, I don't want to have this issue anymore. You know, take care of it, and then the long term it causes a lot of debt. But you know, granted, I personally would think it would be worth it. But anyway, it does cause debt. Uh, number three is divorce. Very expensive. Uh, taking one household and splitting it into two. Uh, and it's attorney fees, you know, um, new apartment deposits, new furniture, you know. It, it's just usually a very expensive thing to go through, uh, and it's not a fun thing to go through either. And that kind of goes with the next one, uh, death of a spouse, similar uh, you're accustomed to the spouse's income, and they pass away, and there's final arrangements. There's a grieving process. Uh, it's a time period where you know you need to take off from work, and it usually you could be left with some medical debt you have to pay. And, and so, death of a spouse definitely can cause someone to get in a lot of debt. Number five is car repair. Um, you're living paycheck to paycheck. We can usually squeak by, but when something unexpected happens, uh, it kind of sends you in a tailspin. You know, you've got to get the car repaired so you can get to work to pay the bills. So if you don't have any money and the car breaks down, you've got to finance it in order to keep your job. So a lot of people find that car repairs put them in debt uh, because it, we feel that having a vehicle is a very high priority. We'll do anything to, to keep that vehicle. Uh, number six is lawsuit. Uh, being sued or anything like that can can be very expensive, and we can owe a lot of money. Uh, having small business and and being sued or, or so forth, so on. Uh, gambling and addiction. Uh, that one's the last one. When we ha have an addiction in our life, it, it tends to take precedence over everything else. That's kind of the definition of an addiction. I have to have it. I'd rather have that than anything else, and so. That, other bills, other obligations take a back seat, and we usually end up getting into debt because we didn't behave responsibly. Okay, major mentality causes of debt. These are on mindsets, the way we're thinking. I mean, my the, my way I make decisions, what I choose to do, my mindset can get me into debt. First one is impatience. Uh, impatience leads to overspending. Imagine the scenario that I am in the market to buy myself a brand new television. And I have been saving for three years to buy the nicest television. I'm going to get myself a good one. And you know that since I've been saving and working really hard for this television for the past three years, when I'm ready to make this purchase, I am going to price around. I am not going to deal with any gimmicks. You know, I am going to make sure that every one of my hard-earned pennies goes to the best deal I can find. Now, on the other hand, let's say that I haven't saved my money, but I've got to have this television right now. Because, you know, if I wanted a television, if I've got decent credit, I could walk into the, I can walk into the electronics store today, peg out the television of my dreams, finance it, and have it delivered for me to watch TV tonight. Um, so let's say that's my scenario. I want my TV. I'm impatient. I'm not going to work for three years to save the money for this television. No, 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 no. I want it tonight. So I go over to the electronics store, and they're like, oh, well, congratulations, Charlotte. We can finance you. Um, so what would you like to purchase? You know, oh, well, since I'm financing it, let's get the television, throw in the, the Blu-ray player, throw in the surround sound. Um, because when we finance things, it doesn't really feel like real money. It's all out in la-la land. It, it's pretend. Um, oh, I'll deal with it at some point. Um, so when I'm impatient, I'll overspend because – I want it now, and it doesn't matter. I'm going to finance it, so it's easier to throw in that extra extra item. Okay, next one, overconfidence, using credit cards unwisely. Um, so in that scenario that I bought that television, I'm unwise with my credit card. 
oh, I'll get it paid off, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter. I know I can do it. I, or have you ever been in a situation where you've been at the store, see something you want, and you're like, yeah, hey, I'll put it on the credit card. i got 30 days to figure out where I'll get the money for this. <laughs> you know, when you slide that card, it, like I said, it's not like it happened in real life. It, it's out in la-la land where credit card happiness exists. Um, but anyway, we, we are overconfident. I'll, I'll take care of it at some point. Negligent. Oh, touching back on our I live by budget. Um, if we are not paying attention to our money, we will spend more than we make. I said it at once. I'll say it again. Uh, we got to be on a budget. If we neglect it, we don't manage it, we will go into debt. Complacency. Um, nothing bad will ever happen to me, or I'll worry about it when I get there. No worries. Uh, I have no emergency savings. I live for the moment. <laughs> when I get money, I spend it. Um, I think I had a friend once that said, you know how do you spell budget? S-P-E-N-D. That's my budget. Spend it. <laughs> so um, when I get money, I spend it. I'm not really thinking about the future, uh, not preparing for a broken down vehicle. I'm not preparing for an illness. I'm not preparing for the water heater to go out, you know, things like that. Oh, when I get there, I'll take care of it. It'll be fine. No worries. Okay. If you are married and you're in debt, it's important to try to work on this together. Uh, it, just like any diet plan or workout plan or anything you've ever been on, it, it's much more tolerable when you have a buddy. Uh, we can't argue about this. We have common goals here. You know, We're going to do this together and, and motivate each other. Because um, this does take some motivation and it takes some and life changes. And so having someone there with you can make a huge difference. And you've got to be on the same page together. And there's no, you can't, it's really hard to, to get out of debt when only one person's involved. So if you've got that spouse, get them involved with this. Okay, so now we're to the point of the presentation where you're like, all right, all right, I'm in debt. Okay, I'll get on a budget. Okay, okay, okay. But I don't know what to start with. I'm in a lot of debt. Where do I begin? What debt is the most important? I hear this question a lot. Um, so as far as debt is concerned, your top priority would be your possessions that can be taken away from you, your property. So first of all, that would be your home and then your car. Uh, if you do not pay your house payment, you will go into foreclosure and they will take you and take your house away from you. If you don't make your car payment, they will come and repossess that car. Uh, not a good position to be in because, especially with a car repossession, I mean, I've met many people that have been through this, and the sad thing about it is you'll have a car loan, you stop making payments on it, they tack on a lot of fees because you're late, finally they come and repossess it from you, they charge you a repossession fee, a towing fee, a service fee, a cleaning fee, an impound fee, an auction fee, a fee, a fee, a fee, a fee, a fee, a fee. A fee. By the time they tack on all their late fees and all of their other random fees, um, you're left with quite a bit owing. Then they go and auction the vehicle for only a fraction of what it's worth, or maybe right at what it's worth. But once again, remember this is technically a bad debt, so it's going to be worth less than you financed it for. And you no longer have a vehicle, yet you still owe them money. Doesn't seem right, but it's true. Um, so that's the sad thing. To add insult to injury, not only do you still owe the money, but you now don't even have a car to get to work. So paying that car payment, very important. Uh, paying that house payment, very important. We, we don't want to lose our home. We want to have shelter. We want to have um, our property protected. So if you're in a position where you're having a hard time making that car payment, it's very important to contact that creditor before they have to contact you and send you to collections. A lot of times they can work in good faith with you, modify your payment plan, or give you a, a month off. Or, you know, they, there's a variety of things they can do for you because I'll tell you that those lenders do not want to repossess your vehicle. Uh, I read in a statistic in 2008, uh, it cost, on average, it cost a lender $8,000 for every car that was repossessed in the United States. So, yeah, you're thinking, oh, but this old junker, it's not worth it. It shouldn't cost them $8,000, but remember, that's an average, so there's the nice vehicle being repossessed as well. So they really don't want to repossess this vehicle. And then next up with the house, 
uh, if, you, if you are possibly facing foreclosure, it is very important to contact a HUD certified housing counselor. Uh, before you contact anybody else that will charge you a fee to help you modify your loan or any of those kinds of things, contact a HUD certified counselor. And you can figure out where you can go at, at HUD.gov. That sounds for housing and urban development. Okay. Um, I mentioned this a moment ago, but we'll say it again. Uh, it's important to contact your creditors before they contact you, and especially before they send you to collections. Once a debt is sent to collections, it's very hard to have any negotiation, uh, very hard to negotiate. If, if you can keep this debt with the original creditor, they are much more likely to be able to work with you and modify your payments. A collection agent is not going to be interested in that as much as the original lender. So make sure you get this taken care of before it's gone to collections because it will be much easier to deal with. Uh, some tips on self-help. Uh, I don't know about you, but I find that it seems like all of my bills are due within the first two weeks of the month. It never fails. So first two weeks of the month, I'm always really strapped for cash. Uh, it makes it a real challenge. But then the, the next two weeks, things are, are looking pretty good. Um, so some simple things that can help is see if you can change some of your due dates. A lot of lenders might be willing to do that for you. Push it out a couple days to make sure it comes after your paycheck because that's one of the greatest challenges is having a bill due the day before you're paid. Um, and one nice thing that can really expedite and, and help you remember to pay your bills is using the online banking services. Uh, some credit card companies will let you go in there even before your bill is due and schedule that payment so you can look at when your next payment, when, when your next payday is. They usually give you a, a nice grace period of time that you have to pay that bill and, and figure and pay it on your payday and schedule it right then and there so you don't forget about it. Uh, a couple words of warning on the online payments though. If you are signed up for automatic withdrawals, that can be great. You know, they automatically withdraw the money from your checking account. So you don't have to worry about being late. Uh, you don't have to worry about not paying the adequate amount, you know, so forth and so on. But you have to make sure that you will have the money in your checking account before they make the withdrawal. Because it usually takes somewhere around five days to get one of those canceled. So if it's the day before your bill is due and you realize you're not going to have the money, you are in trouble. You, you call them up, they're going to likely tell you, well, I'm really sorry, there's nothing we can do about it. Next thing you know, you've got an overdrawn checking account with a nice fat fee that goes with it. And so over time, if you do that several times, that cost way outweighs the benefit of having automatic withdrawal. And also, if, if you use online banking through your bank, remember that it still takes, I think, what, they say seven to ten days to get the payment to the creditor. So you can't go into your bank's website the day before the bill is due and pay it that way and expect it to be there on time. Um, but other than, than those two main things, I, online services are really nice. And you get confirmation numbers. No such thing as the check is lost in the mail. Um, so it, it brings a good peace of mind when you've got that confirmation number. They know that they've received the payments. Everybody's happy. Okay. Uh, consider major changes before they're forced upon you. If you have some sort of items that you owe money on, let's say you've got jet skis, you've got a boat, you've got an extra vehicle, and you see tough times on the horizon, it might be a good idea to sell them now, get them paid off, rather than saying, oh, wow, I just lost my job, uh, and then missing several months worth of payments on that motorcycle, and then deciding, wow, I should do something about this. No, you know, the moment that that happens, you know, sell it, get it paid off before you get late before you're late, and they, they give you a lot of fees. Okay, next passcode is deposit, D-E-P-O-S-I-T, deposit. All right, so methods of paying off your current debt. Um, if you are currently making all of your minimum payments and you're still able to cover all of your basic expenses and yet you don't have any money left, um, there's still an option for you. But the first option is making only minimum payments. We all know that that is an option. Granted, that is the most expensive option and the most time-consuming option, but it is an option. You are making payments. They are receiving payments. You're paying as agreed. People are happy. You are making some progress. Granted, it is very slow and it is very expensive, but you're making progress. The next one is level pay. Now, a second ago, I kind of got ahead of myself, and I said, you know, you're currently making all your payments. You know, everyone's happy. 
Well, what if you took whatever you're paying right now and you never changed that amount? Because you'll notice as your credit cards, as you pay them down, the minimum payment decreases. I don't know if you've noticed that, but it does. So let's say that you have the payment and you can afford the minimum payment right now. Well, let's say you make that minimum payment every month until it's paid off. So as the minimum payment goes down, you're still paying the higher one. And that is called level pay. That will be a little bit faster than the minimum payment route, and you literally wouldn't even feel a difference. Okay, but the moral of the story is, that the more money that you spend, the sooner you'll pay off your debt and the less you will pay. And that is what we like. Less time, less money. We like that. So how in the world can I get some extra money to pay my debt off faster? Well, first of all, once again, I told you I'm a broken record. Get on a budget. Um, believe it or not, statistically, if we are not on a spending plan, 20% of your take-home pay is evaporating in the month. 20%. It is going to dining out, lattes, movies, entertainment, vending machines, who knows what. You don't even know where it went. So get on that spending plan. You are going to be shocked to find out that you actually had a little more money than you thought you did. Okay, the next step. You've got the budget. Things are going okay. I'm on a budget. Okay, I hear you. I'm with you. Um, take a look at your controllable expenses. Look at your groceries. Look at your entertainment. Look at your gasoline. Um, dining out, things like that. See if you can cut back on 10% in each of those categories. Um, you might even be able to come up with 50 to to $100 just by scaling back a little bit. Remember how I mentioned to you I cut back eating out one meal in the weekend and I ate at home instead, and I've literally, it saved me about $80 a month just doing that one thing. So you could change one thing and find 50 to to $100 every month. And then the key is to send that to your payments every month. Um, you think, oh, $50, that doesn't do much. Well, you will be surprised what a difference $50 can make. All right, our goal is to do something that's called a debt snowball. Uh, it's rolling over your payments. So you see those three debts, or well, I guess it looks like four. You've got four debts right there. Now, every month, I have a minimum payment on those debts, don't I? All right, so let's say I found... $40 a month that I'm willing to send extra to my debt repayment. Our first inclination would be to put $10 a month extra on each of the four debts, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I want to pay them off, so let's pay a little extra on each one. Okay, great. Well, believe it or not, the most effective way is to list your debts in order of importance, which we'll talk about how to do that in a moment. So I've got my list of my debts important. So the orange debt's more important than the yellow. The yellow debt's more important than the green. The green's more important than whatever would come after that. So I take that entire $40, and I actually apply it to my little orange debt right there and continue to make the minimum payment on the yellow and the green and then whatever color would come after that. So once orange debt's paid off, Rather than going, you know, woohoo, paid it off, you know, let's go shopping, let's spend that extra money, you know, whatever, let's get into a new debt. No, rather than doing that, I'm going to take that money that was going to that payment, and I am going to add that to the monthly payment I'm making on my yellow debt. So now that, that payment's pretty big, isn't it? I'm actually making two payments to one lender. So then I get that paid off pretty quickly. Then I take that payment, I roll it into the green debt. By the time I'm through green and I'm on to the, the fourth debt, I'm making a humongous payment to that last debt, and I will fly through it. And that is the most effective way to pay off debt. Okay. So some quick numbers just to show you the difference that $50 can make um, right here. So let's imagine we have a credit card balance of $15,000 at a 14% interest rate. You know, currently the payments are $431. But let's say I'm only doing the minimum payments. It will take me 20 years to pay that credit card off, and I will pay $10,000 in interest on it. Uh, it's pretty expensive. Um, so after 20 years, all I have to show for it is a lot of money out of pocket and a paid-off credit card. Okay, next scenario. I take my $50 that I found, and I add that to my $431 payment. Now I'm making a $481 payment, and I continue to make that payment until that card is paid off. I will pay that card off in three years. Huge difference. That is a 17-year savings on that. 
Um, now let's imagine that after that three years, I took that $481 and I put it in savings. Now this number was calculated at a 2.5% a annual yield, which right now, granted, that would be pretty hard to find a savings account that, that earned you that much, but this is just for demonstration purposes. So after that three years, I put that $481 in that savings account at 2.5% annual yield. By the end of 20 years, not only will I have the card paid off, but I will have saved $123,000. Huge difference than the person before. They had nothing to show for it but a paid off card. This person has it paid off and they have money in savings. Now let's say that that person decided to take that $481 after three years and put it in with bonds. And this is calculated at 6% annual yield. They would have $170,000 in savings. Put it in stocks, $230,000. So over 17 years, you could contribute $98,000 of your money and you could generate anywhere from $25,000 to $132,000 additional income. Um, and that's with really not changing your budget at all, adding $50 to your payment, and that is it. Okay, so remember I mentioned prioritizing our debt, lining our debts up in the order we want to pay them off. Uh, there's a few different ways you can do that. Uh, the first one is doing it by the importance of the debt. How important is this debt to you? And, and what that could mean is that secure debt. Remember I talked about we like to get the car paid off, uh, things like that. I want to make sure that I have that car paid off that way. If anything ever happens, I know that car is mine. Um, or let's say you owe a family member some money, and to you that is a very high priority. I've got to get that person paid off. I'm going to put them first. You know, you decide what is the most important. <clears throat> the next, you do it by interest rate. Now, this is the most cost-effective way to do it. Um, the highest interest rate will cost you the most money, so it makes sense. Pay that one off first. It will save you the most money. Uh, this is the way a quote-unquote debt expert would tell you to do it. Um, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I, I honestly think, in my opinion, the most effective way to do it would be by the size of the debt. Um, putting your smallest debt first. Uh, the reason that I would say that is, is because we want to keep ourselves motivated. Remember earlier I said getting out of debt, that's work, get your buddy. Um, stay motivated. And having a small debt paid off can be very gratifying. When you see that little one get paid off, oh, you were going to feel compelled. I'm, I'm doing something. I'm getting somewhere. Let's get something else paid off. You'll be really, really motivated to roll that payment into the next one because you're seeing progress. Because uh, sometimes the highest interest rate debt could be one of your largest debts. Uh, let's say your house happened to be your highest interest rate. Well, it'll be 20, 30 years by the time you get that paid off. You won't see anything happen. So, a lot of times we want to do it by the size of the debt just to keep ourselves motivated. Okay, here's an example of some debt. It's fairly typical. You've got a Visa card, a store card, a car loan, and a gas card. Uh, this person has uh, $22,000 worth of debt. It'll take them 15 years to get this paid off by making minimum payments um, with a total payout of $32,080. or $32, That's over $10,000 extra they're going to be paying. Okay, so let's say that they decided to take the minimum payment route, 181 months. That's quite a long time. Now remember a minute ago I mentioned level pay. So that means taking, you can see right here, that $536 and never changing that amount. Always paying $536. Even though the minimum payment went down, I don't care, we're still paying that. That made a huge difference. You get it paid off in 58 months instead. Um, that's pretty awesome. I mean, that and that's what's really not doing anything at all. Uh, so that's really nice. Um, next up, I'm going to do that power cash. I'm going to find $50 a month to throw in there, and I'm going to do it by the smallest debt first. It will take me only 40 months to pay off all of that debt, and that included the car loan. Remember that. So big difference, 181 months versus 40. Now, if I do it um, by the highest APR, we're at 38 months. You can see there's not a huge difference between APR and the balance in this particular scenario. But personally, I think that it's worth those two months to keep myself motivated and not giving up. Okay, so the interest difference. 
If I make minimum payments only, I'm I'm paying over ten thousand dollars in interest. If I do level pay, I'm at six thousand ninety five dollars. Uh, doing my power cash, finding my extra fifty dollars a month, I'm only at forty eight fifty. Do you see the difference that fifty dollars can make? It's so huge. It's huge. Six thousand dollar difference. And then doing it by APR, I'm paying forty six thirty. Okay. So now we're to the point uh, where you might be saying to yourself, okay, I'm in debt, and I, I've tried doing the debt snowball, um, but you know my interest rates are just so high, and I can't afford the payments, let alone finding any other money. You know, I, I need some outside help um, with my debt. Uh, some advice that I would definitely give, uh, look for someone that has a reputation that can help you. You do not want to find some fly-by-night business. Uh, make sure they have a history with the Better Business Bureau. They are a huge asset. If anybody is ever going to touch your money, check them out with the Better Business Bureau, and you will find out if they've been behaving themselves and if they will do with your money what, what they promise they'll do. And that's part of being audited and accredited uh, by an independent third party. Uh, are they doing what they say they'll do? You know, Are they holding themselves accountable? And any kind of contract or an agreement that they give to you, you get it in writing. Uh, so many times I hear people, oh, well, I, t I t called them on the phone, and they told me I could do such and such, and that saved me $3,500. Woohoo! You know, well, I need to see this in writing before I believe it. Um, anybody that's reputable will give it to you in writing, and they will disclose all of their fees up front, any initial fees, any sign-on fees, and any ongoing fees, monthly fees, fees at the end. Uh, make sure it's all disclosed. So, quick disclaimer, <laughs> uh, I'm not a credit counselor, me personally, but where I work, we have credit counseling. Um, and so that compels me to, to, to clear up some misconceptions with what credit counseling is um, and what it isn't. First of all, what credit counseling does is it helps repay debt dollar for dollar. What that means is every, borrow, every penny that you've borrowed, you will pay back. This is not a debt settlement. This is not negotiating the debt down. Um, this is not a bankruptcy. Um, there's a temporary credit notation. Uh, what that credit notation will do is it'll prohibit you from getting any new credit cards for now, um, which is usually a good thing. If you're to the point where the debt's overwhelming, you probably never want to see another one as long as you live anyway. Um, and there's no direct impact on your FICO score. And FICO. Um, you can, for more information on FICO, you can go to our credit webinar. Uh, but they are the credit scoring company that, that provides your credit score, and they do not take a debt management plan into consideration when they give the score. However, signing into a debt management plan can temporarily affect your credit negatively. Um, once again, go back to the credit webinar and, and for more information on that. But what happens is if you're to the point um, – where you have an outstanding balance on your credit card and you close that account, it then looks like it's maxed out, right? Um, and as you know, 30% of a FICO score comes from your balance to limit ratio. So if you are maxed out, it's going to um, bring down your credit score. But like I said, that would be temporary because over the course of the three to five years that you're on the debt management plan, you are paying down your balances and you are paying consistently on time. And 35% of your credit score comes from paying on time. So after you are finished with the program, your credit score will likely be much higher than it was when you started. Um, so long term, it's a positive for your credit, but short term, it could bring it down a little bit. Okay, when dealing with your debt or having financial issues, a rule of thumb, quick and easy always equals expensive. Uh, going to a payday lender, very expensive. Uh, you go in for a short-term, two-week loan with a fee, and on average, if you were to annualize that fee, you're looking at about 350% interest on the very first two-week loan. And remember that statistically, if, if you go in, an American who goes in and gets one payday loan, within the year they'll get seven more. By the time you, you do that eight times in a year, you're over 1,000% interest on that loan. Um, these are very hard to get out of. I, I nickname a debt trap. Um, it takes a lot of cash to get away from them. Uh, title loans. Uh, this is similar to a payday loan, except you're borrowing against the title on your vehicle. If you outright own your car, you have the title. Um, these APRs usually start at around 200%. Um, 
you know, it's it's pretty expensive though. And and the the sad thing about it is if you stop paying, they'll repossess the car, and you will very likely find yourself in the situation I mentioned earlier, where you no longer have a vehicle yet you still owe money. Uh, so those are also very very risky loans. Uh, rent to owns. Uh, be very careful with these. Uh, the payments that are advertised are usually weekly payments, first of all. And you will be paying at least one and a half to seven times the cost of that item when you do a rent-to-own than if you were to pay cash. So if there's something that you're really wanting, once again, you're going to have to learn some patience. Take the, main, the money that you would have been putting to the payment, save it. You will have the money to pay cash for that item. Um, and, and the sad thing about a rent-to-own is you could be you know, quite a ways into the payment plan and, and miss a payment, and they can come and repossess that item from you, and you've lost all of your progress towards having it. So uh, it's very expensive. Um, I, I talked to a guy once that told me he went to get a computer from a rent-to-own and got it set up and, and then decided on a whim that he would calculate with all the payments how much he ended up spending on that computer. And he said for a $2,000 computer, it was going to cost him $8,000 to buy it from that, that rent-to-own. Uh, so they're very expensive. Um, so things to watch out for, tax refund anticipation loans, uh, RALs. Um, this is when you go to a tax preparer and they say, oh, why wait for your return? We can give you your money right now. Sounds great. Uh, the only thing is there's usually a hefty fee involved in this, hundreds of dollars. Uh, whereas if you were to just file your taxes electronically, wait for it to be deposited, wait for it to be deposited into your checking account, you would have that refund usually within two weeks. So and you can get the full refund. Um, pawn shop loans, they're very expensive. Um, and then they kind of hold you in a, a tough position. I know that you make them a payment to keep them from selling your merchandise. Um, definitely not a good way to get a loan. Um, don't mind shopping there, but, but anyway, they're expensive loans. Um, and then overall, uh, overdraft protection. Um, some people who abuse this are thinking, oh, this is good. You know, I can buy the things I need, and I'll just count on overdraft to cover it for me. I need it now even though I don't have the money. Um, I don't know if you've priced these lately, but, I mean, I've talked to people that are paying upwards of 35 to $45 each time they bounce their checking account. Uh, and there's sometimes a daily fee involved. Every day that you don't pay it back, they charge you another $5, things like that. Okay, so some other damaging options for your credit. Debt settlement, um, not good for you. Um, even if you do successfully negotiate the debt, uh, paying back less than you owe, that will show a negative mark on your credit for seven years. Uh, it doesn't look good to have a debt settlement on your, your credit report. Um, and the sad thing is, is that if, if it's not handled properly, there's a chance that creditor could come back and sue you for the difference again later. Um, and really, the kicker on these, you know, let's imagine the scenario, I'm in $10,000 with a credit card debt. And I go through a debt settlement company, and they manage to negotiate my debt down to $5,000. Um, or let's say, you know, I, actually, they negotiated down to $6,000, 60% of what I owe. That sounds great, right? Well, I only had to pay $6,000 on a $10,000 $10, debt. Well, uh, settlement company is going to charge you a fee, usually a percentage of the amount of debt that was written off. So let's say they charge you 25%, very common, so that's $1,000. Um, guess what? I get taxed on that money that was forgiven. So that five, so that 5000 or excuse me, the $4,000 that they forgave, I will receive a 1099 and I will have to pay taxes on that. That is considered income. The IRS wants their piece. So let's say I pay $1,000 in taxes. So out of pocket, um, I just spent $8,000 on a $10,000 debt. So I quote unquote save $2,000, but I've trashed my credit for seven years. Uh, I could be sued again and then I'll still receive collection calls throughout the process. Uh, and then if you think about it, while you're paying this negotiated debt, um, they're tacking on late fees and, and financing fees and things, so chances are it'll it'll kind of make the debt bigger than it would have been anyway. Uh, so overall, it's usually not a very good alternative um, to paying your debt. And the moral of the story, too, a debt settlement you can do on your own. You don't need to pay a debt settlement company to do that. Uh, I've met people who do that themselves. They owe a debt, and the company offers a settlement, and they accept it. Um, but it's just that, you know, if you have a $10,000 debt, 
who really usually has $6,000 lying around? Most of the time we don't. If we did, we would have paid the debt. So that's the idea behind debt settlement company. Okay, bankruptcy. Um, this stays on your credit report for 10 years. Um, very damaging to your credit. Um, uh, it does still require you to go through credit counseling, and then once the debt's, um, once you've filed, you have to take an educational course. Um, but this is kind of a last alternative when you are in debt, um, and, and it, it stays on your credit for 10 years, and it is it's very expensive to go through. Uh, a lot of people are always shocked by that when I talk to them. They're like, why is it so expensive? Obviously, I don't have any money. I'm filing for bankruptcy, but but all of the fees that are involved are, are very expensive, um, and it's it's usually not a very fun thing to go through. I have yet to meet anybody who's enjoying themselves. Uh, this becomes a public record. Uh, everybody can know about this. A lot of times bankruptcies are published in newspapers. Uh, everyone will know that, that you've been through this, and, and, a lot, and people just don't really enjoy that. Um, ignoring your debt, very damaging. Um, I met a woman one time who, who said, oh, I'm in such a bad situation. I lost my job. I had a $2,000 balance on my credit card. I couldn't afford to make the payments anymore. Now it's up past $4,000. What on earth am I supposed to do? And so, you know, my first thought is, oh, well, you know, it seems like um, you can work something out. And, and I was thinking to myself, I wonder what they told her when they called her. When she called them, I said, well, did you call the credit card company to let them know what happened, what they say? And she just said, I haven't called them. I was like, you haven't told them what's been going on? Well, no. I'm like, well, it's no surprise that your balance would grow so, balance would grow so quickly when they have no idea what's going on. As far as they know, you've just walked away. Um so it's important not to ignore the debt. It will not get better if you ignore it. It will only get worse. Okay, third passcode is DEEP, D-E-E-P. I'm sure you write that down. Um, so tips on staying out of debt. How do I avoid debt in the future? Well, I told you, broken record, budget, 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 budget. So important. Spend less and earn more. Um, save for a rainy day. Put money away. Uh, that way, if, if something happens, the car breaks down or the water heater goes out, you've got some cushion. Uh, it's important that even though you're on an aggressive debt repayment plan, to also still remember to save. You've got to have something there because we don't want to go back into debt even farther. And then, of course, you can always turn to trusted outside help. Um, a lot of times we do need a little help getting through things, but make sure it's with somebody you can trust. All right, and that, that finishes up our debt management class. And remember, go back to where you found this webinar and, and take the quiz that accompanies it so you can get credit. And as always, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to let us know. Thanks, and have a great day.